Welcome to the Taylor Method for Pain-Free Living, a podcast that features enlightening conversations with experts in the medical field that helps to improve the health and well-being of those suffering from chronic pain due to injury. Learn from leading authorities the questions you should be asking to experience pain-free living. Hosted by father and son, Dr. Derek Taylor and Dr. Hudson Taylor, and joined by industry professionals in the health field, including doctors of integrative medicine and personal injury attorneys. Enjoy well-rounded and informative conversations to help you get out of pain while achieving optimal wellness. Dr. Derek Taylor and Dr. Hudson Taylor are the doctors of Taylor Chiropractic and Laser Center in Florida and California. Both father and son duo have earned respect and a solid reputation for successfully helping people transform their lives by assisting them to discover the hidden causes of their painful health challenges, leading them to experience the resolution of their problems using the Taylor Method. Tune in each week to learn about the Taylor Method, Dr. Taylor's proprietary technology that looks at the whole person and identifies the root cause of pain while facilitating natural healing and helps to restore the body to optimal wellness without using drug injections or surgery. Welcome to the Taylor Method for Pain-Free Living podcast. This is Dr. Derek Taylor with Dr. Ali Slater, our foot doctor specialist specializing in ballet injuries. Dr. Ali, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Great to be with you. Now, uh, Dr. Slater, you've been involved with ballet since you were, oh, probably as soon as you started to walk. Can you tell us a little bit about that, how you got in, how you got involved with that? Yes, uh, pretty much spot on there. So I started just as many little girls do and little boys at the age of two years old. And my parents enrolled me in ballet and it just kind of stuck. Um, I did studio classes forever. I auditioned for the Nutcracker when I was in middle school and I was accepted. I got a role in it. And that's really pretty much when my more serious dancing was catapulted. I ended up enrolling in the middle school and high school for the arts. I spent lots of time in the studio doing performances, both at school and at my home studio. I did some summer programs and it was really just my whole world um, leading into college. And it just gave me so much and really defined who I am as a person and my level of discipline. So dance is very near and dear to my heart. Mm, You need to have a lot of discipline in order to do that much dancing. Would you say all that discipline helped you in you becoming the person you are today as far as going, making it through uh, the medical program like that and having to go through all that rigorous testing and schooling? Do you say the disciplines of working with, working in ballet has equipped you and shaped you for this moment where you are at today? Yes, there's no question about that, especially (laughs) because I would say, you know, I chose sort of a non-traditional path to my skill set. So I am not naturally like a science person or a math person. So the sciences were always something that was intriguing and challenging to me. I didn't go into something that was easy for me. And dance is sort of the epitome of that. It's not easy or natural at all for anybody. Yet you just work through it, you persevere, and you progress slowly, little by little. And get better. And really, that is the foundation that laid my entire education and my philosophy and knowing that I could always challenge myself and get through it. Mm-hmm. Now, how did you know you wanted to be a podiatrist? What were you injured? Did you have an injury or something like that? Or did somebody help you? I mean, what, what led you to doing what you are doing today? So I had a minor injury when I was dancing and I had some pain in my toes from point shoes. And I had known a lot of my fellow dancers that had gone to see podiatrists for foot and ankle injuries. And it didn't really click back then, but fast forward to graduating from college and trying to figure out really what my career goals were and where I wanted to go in medicine. Uh, I remembered sort of that experience and having friends of mine having been treated by podiatrists and, and it clicked for me. So that's how I ended up going to into this. And um, I I talked to some podiatrists who were treating dancers, but they weren't doing it as a major part of their practice. And I also saw a need for that in the area that I knew I eventually wanted to work in. 
Mm, great, great. And so um, now, now that you uh, are a doctor that's working with uh, athletes, what are some of the most common ballet foot and ankle um, issues and conditions that you see in your practice? So the interesting thing about dance medicine and dance injuries is they can get the same, dancers can get the same injuries that anybody else has. It really comes down to how it's treated, where you have the difference between a dancer and the general population. That being said, um, most injuries in dancers, about 70 to 80% of them are actually in the foot and ankle lower extremity. So we see everything in, in my practice from basically a, a nail falling off, an ingrown toenail to lateral ankle instability, Achilles tendonitis, bunions, hammer toes, small fractures or something called a dancer's fracture in the fifth metatarsal, stress fractures, just overuse injuries. So all of that can is commonly seen in the dance population and the general population, but those are typically where we're, where we're seeing it most in dancers. And what do you find are the most common, uh, is the most common etiology or causes that you have discovered that is causing a lot of these conditions that you're treating there? Is it uh, the, the, just the overuse? Is it the shoes that they're wearing? Is it wrong technique? I mean, what are your thoughts on the causes of a lot of these conditions? It's important to figure out really what is the thing that's causing it. So overuse is, is a definite, it's a given. Um, dancers don't like to go to doctors because they're afraid that they're going to be told to stop doing the things that they're doing because we know that overuse is just part of the game. So that's why dancers like to go to someone who understands that to begin with. Um, but overuse is an absolute. Then there is poor technique. And it's really incredible because you will see these dancers who are dancing at a high level and they're just strong as an ox, strong as can be. They are just, you look at their physique and they're all muscle, very lean, but they'll have things like hip instability and they'll have their core might not be as strong as you think. So it's really, it can be caused by weakness in some areas they're not focusing on as much in their day-to-day -day movement activities. Um, and then it can be a, something as simple as their, their shoes not fitting properly. So when you're talking about particularly in ballet, female dancers in point shoes and having a, an ill-fitting point shoe, that could be part of the problem. So it's really being able to both zoom in and zoom out on where these issues are. Mm -hmm. And that's where your expertise comes in with just all the years of experience that you've had doing ballet, um, getting them in the right shoe, making sure they are doing the right technique. I mean, I think one of the challenging parts is it, I, just the demanding schedule, and especially when you're training for a performance and you know, you're know you getting to crunch time, You know, it's not like you can just do this, uh, you know, there's a schedule and you're, you're on a routine and they, you have to have that performance uh, perfect, right? By the time that you are on for the show. So how do you get around that when they are so physically demanding, putting all that pressure on their feet and ankle um, and it's just that overuse, but they have to do that. I mean, what have you done to help them accomplish that uh, without missing their practices and um, training before the show. Right. So that sort of is the crux of it right there. Basically the first step is getting in the psychology of a dancer and understanding where they're coming from. I think if you can look at your patient's perspective and really understand them globally, you can have a better idea of where to go. So for many people, this is their chance, their moment. This is they're at their peak physiologic age. This is the time in their career when they have to do this despite an injury. So looking at a dancer's perspective from that is helpful because you say, hey, this is my one shot. I know I have this problem, but I'm gonna have to get through it no matter what. So meeting them where they're at is critical. Sometimes we have to sacrifice a full cure in order for us to be able to get through the performance or make it to the end goal of what they're doing, end of the season, wait for a break, and then get 100% better. But what you do is you basically can modify 
their rehearsals, their shoe gear, the intensity of their activity, both in and out of the studio to get them where they need to be and ready for the performance. So for instance, that might be talking to them in very specific techniques. And this is where having a background in dance is helpful as I can say, use their language, say something basically like, I'm okay with you doing bar work, but when you get out to the floor, no sautés, no grangetés, skip those exercises because they're too high impact for what you're going through. And that's sort of using the language. Anyone can be a dance medicine specialist if they learn the lingo and they learn what dancers go through. And that's where it's helpful to know. It doesn't mean you have to be, if you decide tomorrow you wanna be a dance medicine specialist, you don't have to have done dance for years and years, but you do have to understand the nature of these activities and where you can push and pull back. Mm. Yes, very good. Yeah, I can see just the advantage that of just having all that experience. I mean, it's it's one thing to learn the lingo of ballet, but it's another thing to to know it internally and have experienced it for many years. And that's what you bring to the table. So when regards to the conditions, what would you say is your favorite condition to treat um, that you really get the best results with when it comes to ballet injuries and conditions? Well, I like the ankle. I like ankle pathology. I like ankle instability. I like Achilles tendonitis. I like treating those because the pathology is interesting, but it can also be frustrating for, for dancers because it's a really painful conditions. Sometimes, you know, a good old fashioned ingrown toenail will get me through for a while because you can immediately relieve these problems. Right. These other pathologies that are more interesting per se, they often take a lot more time to relieve. So I like it all. It all has its pros and cons. It's hard for me to pick one favorite thing. So what do you do for that? Let's say somebody's got an Achilles tendonitis uh, mm -hmm. or some ankle instability. What is your protocol that you do to resolve that for a patient? So it really depends on the patient. So we'll put on the lens of a dance medicine um, patient at this moment. So if you're talking about ankle instability, it comes down to what you're doing inside the studio and outside of the studio and making sure we get them first to a really good physical therapist. I have uh, people on my on my team, I like to say people I refer to who know dance medicine and they know how to take care of these patients and what their needs are. So getting them to somebody who really understands the ins and outs of both foot and ankle and dance medicine, what they need, doing some kinesiology taping techniques, really honing in on conservative treatment. Um, talking about what do you wear inside your shoes? So are we, are we bracing when they're out of the dance shoe so that we can kind of bide our time or are we letting it ride? Um, so it really depends and it depends on the level of pathology. Because we do, sometimes we need to do MRIs. We need to know what's going on. So it's being both aggressive in diagnosis and conservative in treatment. I, I am surgically trained and I love to do surgery, but these are not the patients where you're looking through the lens of a surgeon right away. You're reserving that for major last resort. Mm -hmm. And um, in regards to exercises, so in regards to the rehab and the exercise and all, do you often refer that out to physical therapists then, or do you, are you doing some of the kinesio taping yourself or how does that work with your patients? So I'll start them with kinesio taping in the office, just a little bit. It's not per se my area of expertise, but I, I know some kinesiology taping techniques that are helpful for our patients. And then I will refer out for therapy because I want aggressive therapy. That's much more than I'm able to do in the office. I'm going to bring them out for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, what other conditions do you um, commonly see with uh, specifically with the ballet? Is it more acute? conditions that you're seeing or more chronic repetitive conditions that you're seeing? You know, it's both. Um, but I would say when you're talking really in the musculoskeletal category, it tends to be going on chronic in this population, just because in my experience, these patients have waited until the last possible moment to come see a doctor. They're, they're putting it off as long as they can. So 
in my experience, it's more erring on chronic, but that's to, it's not one or the other specifically. We also see acute things. A fracture would be acute. You know, a, a nail falling off would be acute. A sprain is acute. So we do see all of that. Mm -hmm. So do you see a lot of um, just stress fractures that are misdiagnosed maybe at another office or or somebody who's not looking for that or quite, quite has been uh, trained for that type of um, understanding and diagnosis? Do you see that often stress fractures with your yeah. patients? Absolutely. And I think this is really critical to understand because in the dance world, we have a lot of issues with nutrition and physique and psychology. And so while this has definitely become better over time with education and counseling, and really the whole dance world has gotten friendlier to multiple body types, there still are pressures, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I promise I'm getting back to fractures on this. Mm -hmm. We often see that female dancers in particular may suffer from some malnutrition. Um, they can have early onset osteoporosis if there's some type of eating disorder involved. Uh, and it's very important to understand that aspect because we can see stress fractures from overuse, but we can also see them from bone density issues, from mm. a lack of proper nutrition, being not as healthy as they should be, even though oh. they look like a picture of health. So yeah, that's something really important to understand, especially in this population. These patients can be more at risk for things like stress fractures. And that's a real keen observation you make because a lot of uh, docs probably wouldn't associate with that. They would think, wow, this gal is you know, uh, doing her ballet dancing five days a week. She's all doing all these weight bearing activities and you, she's not gonna have an issue with osteoporosis, but you just demonstrated the importance of nutrition with these people. And if they're not eating the right diet and they're not getting the building blocks for the bones, wow. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're setting themselves up for a stress fracture, aren't they? I mean, with poor nutrition. Right, exactly. A stress fracture, you know, maybe at best, it could be much worse. Yeah. And where do you find those fractures to be typically, like in the fifth metatarsal or where do you commonly see those stress fractures taking place? And what are the what are the symptoms that you'll see? Let's say there's a, one of our listeners right now that has a foot, she's a ballet dancer and she's having problems in the foot and she's so concerned. I, I wonder if I have a stress fracture. How would, you know, what are some of the telltale signs that you're going to be seeing as a, an astute physician like yourself when somebody comes in like this? And so what the, it's, it's typically kind of a low grade achy pain. It's not really Sharp, it's not shooting, but it's well localized. So you can really pinpoint a spot normally. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see them all the time in the forefoot, in the metatarsals, or in the middle of the metatarsals. You can get a stress fracture of, of any bone technically, but especially when you're talking dancers, these are really load bearing bones, um, especially when they're on like demi point, which is when you're on not a full point, not on the tips of your toes, but on the base of your toes. The metatarsals really have, take a lot of pressure. So that's, oh, a, that's really a lot of stress on those bones, your whole weight and yeah. you're bouncing around as well. Yeah, right? exactly. So. Exactly. So they might feel some, some low grade, dull, achy pain that just doesn't go away. It may, it may go away for a couple hours in the day, but it's pretty much consistently there all the time. And when they're walking a lot, they may feel it most at the end of the day. So when someone has these issues, you can take uh, x-rays and it usually takes a couple of weeks for you to be able to see it on an x-ray. And what I'll see on an x-ray is either a tiny little crack in the bone, like a teeny tiny little thing, or more commonly cortical thickening, which is the outside of the bone that may show some, some thickening. It will look extra white, thick white line on the uh, x-ray. and um, then sometimes it's not perceptible, but the symptoms really seem like they're a stress fracture and they'll have to go for an MRI. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So how often will you maybe sometimes that occurs where the, the stress fracture is so subtle won't show up on an x-ray, but then it'll show up on a CT scan or MRI, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, now if somebody has a stress fracture like that, what would your protocol be? What would you do in your office for somebody that has a condition like this? And how long would they anticipate to for that to recover? So that's a really good question and a really tricky subject when you're talking about someone who can't stay off of it. Because the treatment for even a stress fracture, any fracture is typically some period of immobilization for six to eight weeks. There's two reasons you can't do that in advance. Or one, because they can't do it. Two, because immobilization causes weakness, uh, as I'm sure you know, and all the things that you treat. So, you know, on, in my general population, they're getting a boot, a walking boot for for a little while. I like to get people out of boots as soon as I can, regardless. That's just my protocol. Sure. Because I think they cause more harm than good. But uh, when you're talking about dancers, you really can't do this. So you put them in a like a, a walking shoe, maybe a stiffer soled shoe. You modify as much as you can. If you can get them to stay off of it, even two weeks, it would be helpful. You may not be able to, you may just have to work through it when they're done with their performance, then they're in a boot. So adjusting based on the needs of the patient, but my typical preference would be, Hey, I'm putting you in a boot for four to six weeks. We'll keep checking on it. See how you're doing. But in the dancers, it just doesn't, it does not necessarily work that way. So you have to look at how severe this is, how long it's been going on. Um, is there a risk of having an overt through and through fracture converted? Maybe, you, you know, so I would say modifying as much as possible, letting the dancer do as much as they possibly can working through it, and then keeping them in the stiffest sold shoe possible when they're outside of the studio so that they can get better. Hmm. Now, let's say uh, ballet season is over. Or is there a particular shoe that you recommend for your patients that you like to see them wearing? Um, maybe a brand or in regards mm -hmm. to just for overall good foot health that, um, that you recommend for your patients? So these days, my recommendations tend to be a little bit more style specific than brand specific. So I don't write any brands off or in per se, but I have them pass the shoe test, which basically means when you're looking at the shoe, they all will bend at the toes. They're supposed to bend at the toes. But when you pick up a shoe and you hold your the toe of the shoe in one hand and the heel of the shoe in another, you should not be able to bend that shoe toe to heel in half. If you can do that, you're not in a good shoe. So a typical recommendation for our patients would be like an Asics, a Brooks, a New Balance. Um, I love on running shoes myself. I wear those, but you can find a good shoe in a Nike if that's your prerogative, if that's what you like to wear. It's just that that shoe has to meet those specifications. It can't be too stiff. It can't be too, um, it definitely can't be too thin. So uh, that's my, my sneaker protocol. And then as far as recovery shoes, I'm a big fan of the UFOs myself. Uh, they are very comfortable. They're marketed as surgical recovery shoes, athletic recovery shoes, and I think they do that pretty well. Mm -hmm. Great. So your shoe test of, yeah, you bend it from heel to toe, should bend more at the toes, not in the middle of the shoe. Is there mm -hmm. other things that they should look for um, when they're testing with the shoe that you like to do? It, sometimes it's just based on the pathology. So for instance, if somebody has a lot of pain on the top of their foot, say they have a spur or something there, I would say, look for a shoe with a soft mesh upper, something that's going to stretch for you, give you breathability. That's a good shoe for that type of person. Um, high tops used to be, some people used to think that like, if you have ankle instability, you should go with a high top shoe. That's actually not proven to be helpful. It doesn't actually add to any ankle instability. So that's kind of a common misconception. Looking for quality materials. Um, you know, a thick rubber sole, just again, something that's not super flexible. And um, I do tend to make different recommendations based on different pathologies, but that would be a general guideline. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then would you recommend like uh, for your young um, patients, let's say they're in ballet, maybe they're in middle school or high school, even before like uh, the, the the season starts or they start to get ramped up for the performance, 
that they would come see you for like a do you do some type of evaluation for them, just kind of getting a baseline check on them? Is that something that you recommend for your patients to do? Yeah, that's a really great question. So a lot of times that will fall really into the physical therapy category to see identify areas of weakness, something that we can do too. But it's something that maybe the, the physician and the therapist, I would say, work together on. So yes. Mm -hmm. And no, <laughs> um, but specifically like a point to evaluation would be something that you would see a qualified physician to do. Um, and that is something where you, you evaluate the stability, the strength of the feet and the ankles, the range of motion to assess if a, if a dancer is ready to be in a point shoe. So that would be something that we would do like before the season, if they're curious, sometimes their dance teachers will send them over. I've had dancers come in and say, hey, I have ingrown toenail problems and I just wanna get them fixed before I start dancing for the season. That kind of thing is, is definitely appropriate. There's always, it's always worth it to get an evaluation though. Yeah. And then what about uh, the big thing that you mentioned earlier in the show is uh, diet. I mean, um, this is probably even harder to work with in regards to some of their changing some of the dietary patterns and habits that they've developed. But uh, if they really want to be proactive in preventing a stress fracture, they really should consider that. I mean, do you um, help patients with that as well? You know, I'm I'm a really big believer in referring people to specialists in areas of expertise and I'll definitely give them my recommendations and then I'll refer them to somebody who's qualified to counsel them specifically on nutrition. Um, so I will tell them you need to eat lean protein. That's really important. You know, chicken, fish, um, very lean pork, that's fine. Or if they are vegetarians, they need to get enough tofu, beans, that kind of thing. I, I really stress that. Um, sticking to sort of a, like a lower dairy, more anti-inflammatory type of diet is helpful. Um, but uh, you know, when you, when you talk to dancers about this, it's so critical that you do it appropriately and that they don't take away, don't eat. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just really focusing on good, healthy things and encouraging them to get that in their diet, good fats, like nuts. I will definitely counsel patients on this. And then I'll also bring in experts to, to boost the recommendation. Well, it sounds like you have a really good, uh, just the whole nuances, the just getting in the mindset of a dancer is, is really important when you're communicating with them, when you're dealing with them. And uh, it sounds like you, uh, you really have a, a sensitivity and understanding to that, of that, just because of, if they hear it the wrong way, it could be, I mean, not, not a good thing. <laughs> so exactly. You got it. That's exactly how. <laughs> so anyway, well, this has been a fascinating show. I appreciate your insights on just the ballet world and injuries. Is there any closing comments, anything you would like to uh, say as we end our time together? I think the only thing I would like to add is just for anyone that's listening, any athletes, regardless of your discipline, really the sports medicine world is evolving in sports specific exercise and look for providers in your area who not only treat, do practice sports medicine, but do things specific to your activity. I think that patients can get a lot out of that. Um, any physician in that that's in the sports medicine arena is definitely qualified to treat, but I think that patients get a lot out of having the conversations with the detail of their activities. So for instance, I'm not an expert in football, but if I know somebody that is, I think that the patient will really benefit from having those detailed discussions with them in that area. So I would encourage patients to look that kind of thing up and just to be healthy and live their best possible life and stay strong so they can keep on doing what they love to do. And if they're having issues that there's someone, there's someone around to help you out with it. Hmm. Great, great words of wisdom. Well, uh, we've been with our guest, Dr. Ali Slater. Uh, and doctor, can you tell us how they can best get a hold of you, how um, they can reach you, our audience, if they would like to make an appointment with you or get a consult with yourself? 
Yes, definitely. Well, my uh, information is posted on the IADAMS website. That's the International Association for Dance Medicine and Science. So you can go there and search for a provider. I'm under podiatrist, Dr. Slater. You can also see that this is a multidisciplinary approach. There's a lot of providers in there. For me specifically, also my private practice, I'm in a group setting at Palm Beach Foot and Ankle. We're in Palm Beach Gardens, West Palm and Boynton Beach. And you can find our office info at palmbeachfootcare.com. And what's the best uh, telephone number that they can call your office at? It's 561-848-7722. Great. Well, thank you so much again for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be on our show. And um, I think a lot of patients are really going to benefit from, especially the, and those in the dance world, from the information that you shared with us today. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me. Great talking to you. Okay. Thank you for listening to the Taylor Method for Pain-Free Living podcast. For more information about the Taylor Method and how you can find lasting pain relief, visit www.drderektaylor.com. That's www.drderektaylor.com.